Welcome to the first session of philosophy of modern analysis in the current climate crisis and its connection to energy extraction and consumption. Philosophical reflections and scientific concepts such as energy, entropy, and information, each originating from interrelated fields of thermodynamics, statistical mechanics, and information theory, have assumed increasing theoretical and practical importance. Bernard Stegler, for instance, coined the term Anthropocene and dedicated a significant portion of his final writings considering how a current situation might very well be caused by an acceleration in the production of entropy at all levels, from the physical and biological to the psychical. If Stagler's evaluation of the current situation is accurate, it is crucial that we research the history of these related disciplines' philosophical reception to grasp the current predicaments underlying causes and respond with the prudence. This seminar provides assessing the whole view of main philosophical currents that have turned to the study of thermodynamics from the earliest reflections by New Kantians like Herman von Hempholz, Frederick Lang, Frederick Nietzsche, the slightly later French reception by Henry Bergson, and less well known individuals like French cosmologists, Leo Duhem, Henry Mason, and Andre Lenormand. The seminar will also cross the so called disciplinary divide, discussing mid century analytical accounts by philosophers such as Hans Weinbach and Kana and more recent work by Lawrence Clark and David Z. Albert. Finally, it will finish with a summary of the present debate that centers around figures such as Simon Dong, Stengels, and Stegler. The scientific themes covered and the philosophical problems approached will include that the direction and shape of time, the metabolic and energetic conditions of life, work, and society, the relationship between entropy, information, complexity, and probability, the philosophical or metaphysical foundations of these related sciences, as well as more speculative cosmological topics such as beginning and the end of the universe. Joel White, the instructor of this seminar, is a research affiliate of Research Network the Philosophy of Technology and executive editor of Technofang, the Network's Academy Journal. His research is situated in the emerging transdisciplinary fields of contents of philosophy of media, science, and technology. Currently focusing on how 19th century thermodynamics was received into philosophy and literature, and how scientific concepts, including energy, entropy, and information, have become philosophical concepts. He has published articles and book chapters related to this research, including on the notions of signification, energy, education, and educational philosophy and theory, art and entropy in aesthetic literacy, entropy from the peak, entropy, entropy in form and PFI, Warwick Journal of Philosophy. Kant and digital immortality in aesthetics and phenomenology, information overloading and internet and parallax. He has a book chapter out on bias into indeterminacy, in contingency and plasticity in everyday technology. He's also a published translator of French 20th century out of God, having published a book-length translation of Antonin Otter's several useful messages, an active cinematographer and colorist. His films in collaboration with artist Madison Biker have also been nominated and shown at the Villa Medici Film Festival and Anne Arbor Film Festival. I'm now going to pass the mic to the instructor. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, pretty, I will. I will now. I will now share the screen so that um, we can get started. Um, okay, that's week one. Here we go. So, okay. So the um, yeah. So there's a there's a from that description. Actually, I realised that there is a you know that I think maybe I was a bit ambitious. There was a lot to cover um, in this. Uh, uh, in this, what could be called the philosophy of thermodynamics, um, which in a sense kind of doesn't really <laughs> exist as a kind of spe specialty, you know. I mean, it kind of does in the analytic tradition, but it's it's not something that is uh, that is you know uh, uh, a particular domain that is is. Despite the fact that quite a lot of people have have, have written on it, as I would like to show, you know, it's not a um, it's not a course you can take many places. Okay, the. Uh, the, the other thing that I thought, uh, if people can see this, right, in the in the, the shorthand for thermodynamics, as, uh, as the 19th century scientists used to hand around, is theta delta x. Um, so when they used to write letters to each other, they used to write using this uh, this this delta uh, theta delta x. So if that pops up, that's what that refers to. It refers to to thermodynamics or the changes in heat. Okay, so um, what I'll start by looking at is the kind of some of the texts that we will cover. Um, for the next four weeks. The, the way that I will get through them is a kind of mixture of, uh, of looking at some of key quotes, talking through them, 
looking at as well as the kind of the history, historical development of this as a science, because as many sciences, you know, it, it only kind of gets named retroactively as such. Um, and so we will look at that, the way that it kind of develops, uh, the, the problems that, that kind of uh, that occur and the different schools of thought that kind of uh, that arise in thermodynamics. The thing that's also slightly difficult with it as well is that we have kind of what's understood as classical thermodynamics, which is that which is named as such by the end of the 19th century. Um, and we also have statistical mechanics, um, which is then also named as such slightly later as well, and which is very similar school, but it's kind of a different mathematical approach to many of the similar, similar problems. Um, we also have information theory, which obviously takes a lot from the mathematics of particularly statistical mechanics, which we won't look at so much because it's a kind of a whole another history, the history of information, although information as a concept will also be, uh, is also important and it, kind of, it does come up as early as the 19th century, um, particularly with people like Boltzmann and Maxwell or the, or the way that they're trying to grapple with the problems of heat. But um, so as I go through, I will give kind of bits of this history uh, and talk about the kind of key figures and the key problems within the science, um, as well as the kind of integrated uh, problems that, that kind of were picked up by, by philosophers and epistemologists um, along the way. So to kind of, uh, kind of go through the first set of um, first set of texts that I wanted us to, to look at or kind of read uh, this week, kind of split into two lots. Um, and I will probably only manage to get through this, this kind of first lot, if you will, the more kind of cosmological problems. Um, the way that the people such as Engels and Marx uh, and Podolinsky took up the question of thermodynamics in a kind of an economic, political sense, um, I will, might get there to the to the to the end of it. But the, if not, I will try to carry on uh, some of that next week. What I wanted to do, particularly today, though, is kind of concentrate on making sure that we kind of understand what is at stake and what became to be at stake for the early reception. So we're staying really at the end of the 19th century. Um, of course, Marx and, uh, and Engels are, are also at the end of the 19th century, but we kind of look at the, the, the more kind of epistemological problems uh, first, because I think that it gives a, a good under, underpinning to, for some of the more economic and, and political problems that arise. So today we'll be mostly looking at, uh, at Helmholtz, uh, Friedrich Lang uh, and Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche probably um, is the most, although there, there's not that much written by him on thermodynamics, it's probably some of the most interesting stuff um, that occurs at, at this period of time. Um, he's also contextual, so he's also within a kind of debate that is going on with other people as well, and I will talk a little bit about them. Um, but certainly Nietzsche is the one that kind of phrases it with the most, uh, uh, with the most vigor. So we will be looking at uh, we're looking at Nietzsche quite a bit today, um, as well as kind of where his arguments about the eternal return come from, how he tries to look at that from a thermodynamic perspective. Um, okay, so the, the the Marxist ecology stuff, um, in particular this the Ukrainian Sergei Podolinsky, um, I might get to by the end, but if not, we'll certainly kind of pick up next week. Um, once. Uh, the kind of the main text, though, for next week, if I kind of don't, uh, you know, if we, if we, if we, even if we do start with with looking at some of the Marxist, Marxist ecology stuff, we'll be looking at probably the 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 strongest reception, philosophical reception of thermodynamics that occurs at the cusp of the turn of the century, um, and this can be understood as the the French epistemolo epistemological school. So. Epistemology, uh, epistemology is a separate discipline and is not doesn't mean exactly the same as it does, say, within a kind of philosophy, uh, anglophone kind of context. Uh, French epistemology or historical epistemology um, is still actually a separate discipline. So you're, you're, if, you, if you teach in France, you can teach uh, epistemology and not necessarily uh, teach philosophy. They're understood as the, I suppose, the history of the philosophy of science in a way. Um, very, very important school. It's the same school in a way that, that kind of forms people like Bachelard, and Canguillem, and Foucault, uh, Althusser. These are all in the kind of similar, uh, especially Foucault and Althusser at the end of this, of this school. 
Lots of very unknown figures as well, though, uh, in this, this cusp of the 19th century, because arguably people like Bergson um, take all of the kind of uh, historical weight um, and attention away from some of these other, other figures. So I have asked us, though, to look at, in particular, Bergson's uh, third chapter, because the other stuff, not a lot of it is translated, and I, was, I am working on translations of them, but I didn't manage to get, get through them. So... Um, I will be asking us to look at Bergson, obviously, which is translated, um, and also Simondon, who kind of arguably you could say, although not an epistemologist per se, as in his, he doesn't teach, doesn't teach that in, in France, could be understood as a French philosopher of technology, certainly comes from out of and having read this school. Um, so we will finish or we'll look also in particular at Simondon's reception and, and his kind of... Uh, his, his philosophy of, of, of energy and information, and particularly looking at the relationship between form and energy and the concept of metastability um, that really is Simondon's kind of, uh, you know, the, his historical importance, I think, is arguably to the kind of the, the, uh, the allowing metastability to become a philosophical concept. In this as well, we'll look at lots of questions of life as well, because obviously Bergson evolution, um, the relationship between energy and life will, and entropy will be uh, will be important um, will be important in, in those for those texts. So the the third week um, changes tack kind of uh, slightly. It kind of goes into a, a kind of different, completely different re reception. Um, goes into the analytic reception of it, um, which you know is there. Um, interestingly enough, the a lot of the analytic philosophy of science stuff, and this is you know, uh, Sklar will talk about this, um, has concentrated on uh, quantum mechanics and other problems, uh, especially kind of epistemology and quantum mechanics a lot, and not really dealt so much with thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. Though these three are probably the most prominent. Um, Hans Reichenbach can be seen as the kind of founder of this tradition, um, himself kind of coming out of, uh, of, of Vienna and very, very important, his very important readings of Boltzmann. Um, and you can see in this, in, in this tradition that the, the problems are much more to do with the foundation of the science. So to what extent can the science be said to be reduced to other forms of sciences? Are the problems in thermodynamics the same as the problem in mechanical, in statistical mechanics? So can you uh, reduce the way that entropy is derived, classically speaking, to just probability? Um, one of the big problems also here uh, in the analytic, analytic tradition is the notion of the arrow of time. So does time have an order? Does time have a direction? Does entropy, can we derive the direction of time from entropy? Um, or is it just something that seems to be uh, analogical, but one can't derive one from the other? Um, these kind of questions are, are very prominent in this in this uh, in this tradition, as well as trying to think of some of the also the the big bigger kind of cosmological problems as well as as such as you know does the general uh, does the general universe act as the same as which the local universe seems to seems to act as well, um, and so that will be when we look at this we'll look in particular at the problems of of cosmology of reversibility and the direction of time. Um, it's I also think a very very useful set of texts for trying to understand uh, uh, the statistical mechanics. So Bolt what Boltzmann has to say about entropy, I think that this is this reception really, really kind of helps for, helps us try to understand that. Okay, so the the last text, um, and this was quite hard to, I mean, all of them were actually quite hard to, to, to make a choice of what we were going to look at. We we'll look at the recent reception. So, so some texts that are probably more familiar to to a lot of people, um, maybe not. But um, I would say that this is kind of a good um, overview of some of the more recent um, takes or kind of a return to the problem of, of thermodynamics. In particular, although it's not set, but the the Isabel Stengers and the the Prigogine introduction to order out of chaos. This is a very very good introduction to what was probably the, the return to that within the continental tradition. Um, and 
Stiegler as well, probably being the, the foremost kind of uh, thinker of, of entropy of thermodynamics towards the end of his end of his life. Um, and especially, I would say, especially the, the kind of interest or the return to this has been peaked by was peaked by Stiegler. Um, and these last texts are very, very interesting because you can see also Stiegler uh, grappling with trying to understand what entropy is as well and grappling with what thermodynamics is trying to say to us. Um, and obviously, it's a, it's a much more, uh, uh, Stiegler's work is much more political in orientation, ecological in orientation um, than some of the others. So we will look at these three and, and the other, the last one, Brassier as well, um, I think is a, a very good, especially that, that last uh that last section of the of um, Nihil, um, Nihil Unbound is a very good and very good representative as well of of, of kind of a, a response, a philosophical response to what thermodynamics, uh, in particular the, the problem of entropy, is is uh, is you know saying or, or forcing us to think. Um, so, um, other than a kind of you know these are the kind of the main text. There are other ones that could have been included and. Um, for the kind of final works, you know, I'm absolutely fine for people to, to work in other texts that they might be reading. Same for the presentations, because despite what people, you know, sometimes uh, lots of people think that there wasn't much of a reception, a philosophical reception of thermodynamics, where it hasn't really influenced, you know, there has actually been quite a lot. Um, so there is, a, there is a lot to talk about. Okay, so. I obviously, uh, other than kind of just reading the history, um, And uh, you know, principally, will not try to convince you of my own reading of all of this, um, although it will be there uh, underneath everything. Have my own, one could say, methods or my own means of uh, of reading a lot of this stuff. Um, that has come into distinction to some of the other receptions. So uh, you know, it does kind of place itself in distinction to them. Um, this is my kind of two pronged method. Um, that I've kind of developed over the last couple of years. And I obviously will be kind of using this as I, as I kind of read through the stuff. So the, the way that I, uh, my approach to kind of reading in particularly, in particular the kind of history of science is not just that, I suppose the history of ideas you could say is to use uh, something that I've started to call a critical epistemology. Um, now, there are some other people that use this term, but not in the same way. But the, the way that I the way that I see this is um, I kind of thought about a, a means of kind of putting together some of the questions and problems that historical epistemology, um, as it kind of um, presents itself in the French school. Um, so kind of questions related to uh, paradigms or episteme, as, as Foucault comes to talk about it. So the way that particular structures and conceptual frameworks come to, to function as the conditions of possibility of what we know or, or what we can think, um, and the way that they structure our kind of, uh, our, as, as, as Foucault calls, the order of things. So the way that things maybe even themselves are structured via a conceptual, particular conceptual framework. So that's the kind of a, a, the epistemological uh, questions, you know, what does thermodynamics is it a paradigm? Is it a general paradigm, as someone like Kuhn might call it? Is it an exemplar? Does it do, do does its conceptual structure? Is it used in order to understand other things? Um, does it limit the way that we see the world? Does it restructure the way that we see the world? Um, those are some of the questions that the kind of the epistemological uh, side to my kind of method will ask. The, the critical side comes from two. Uh, schools of thought, maybe I suppose you could call it that. critical theory um, and just critical philosophy in general. So uh, the critical theory, as you know, is a, is a kind of well, well known uh, school of thought. Um, but what I kind of take from this is, is an attempt to try and think about also the, I suppose, the conditions or the continuation or the reproduction of modes of, uh, of production and the way that um, the uh, a structure of thought feeds into um, a structure of production and the way those two things are mutually reproduced. So why is it that, what is a thermodynamic episteme? What is a thermodynamic worldview? How does it complement or contradict or, or complicate uh, the reproduction of say capitalism as a mode of production? Um, how would it complement or 
complicate socialism as a mode of production, for example. Um, and these are obviously questions, those particular questions, very, very important for Marxist ecology, uh, people like Burkitt and, and Foster and Marx and, and, and Engels themselves. Um, the critical, um, the other critical side is, is the kind of Kantian. So um, lots of the people that we will be looking at, uh, you know, in, shortly, uh, if we look at, think about people like Helmholtz, uh, who was a, a German, uh, 19th century German scientist, as well as Friedrich Lang and Nietzsche, these can all be seen to a certain extent to partake of neo-Kantianism. Um, I say that for Kant, perhaps. The other two are neo-Kantians, in particular Lang. Um, and what does the kind of Kantian critical method do to something like, or, or ask to something like thermodynamics? Um, why is it different than, say, a speculative way of thinking about thermodynamics? In other words, do some of the conclusions of thermodynamics produce certain limits for thought? Are we to stretch these concepts, you know, concepts such as energy and entropy to the cosmological level? Is that, you know, is that, is that possible? Is that something that we should do? What does it do when we try to do that? Um, and to what extent do some of these ideas actually function as ideas? And that is to say they function as kind of regulative ideas, ideas that might unify certain uh, sets of, of experience, but cannot necessarily be uh, experience themselves, something like the end of the universe, you know. Um, these are, you know, were also very important uh, problems for Kant as well, in the, especially in the dialectic of the first critique, the problem of, uh, of cosmology in the beginning and the end of the universe. So that's where the kind of critical part comes in. Um, the last thing before we kind of turn to, to Nietzsche is a method called uh, what I kind of call, call transduction. Um, so if the first uh, part of the method, the kind of critical epistemology can be understood as the, as the analytic, uh, insofar as it's trying to analyze the way that kind of conceptual structures function together, the, the transductive side I see as a kind of synthetic, uh, or it's kind of the creative side, if you will. Um, so transduction comes from Simondon and isn't necessarily his method. Um, um, he kind of has other words for the methods that he, he uses, uh, allegomatic, for example. But the, the way that I look at transduction um, is very, very similar to the way that uh, Cecil, so Cecil Malaspina looks at it. Um, and that is that it is potentially a, a method of a uh, transdisciplinary method that attempts to understand uh, or deduce concepts across disciplines. So if certain disciplines or, or episteme or conceptual structures have certain internal problems or concepts, what does it mean to take those conceptual problems and structures into another domain and complicate that domain? Um, for example, the, the, the analogy of, uh, of the crystal that, that Simondon uses when precisely talking about transduction, is that you have, say, a, a supersaturated solution, um, and once then you the the the, the crystalline germ enters into that solution, a kind of crystal a crystal may form. It kind of gives the energy, if you will, the the, the kind of crossing point, the critical point of which then something new may uh, kind of form from out of it. I see that to a similar extent analogically as a philosophical method, insofar as we can think of different disciplines or domains of knowledge as kind of supersaturated domains. Um, esoteric in that sense that they are kind of internally uh, uh, internally closed and what we can do is we can take concepts and structures from other domains and and, and, and introduce them into supersaturated solutions and to see what happens almost experimentally if you will so this is the kind of synthetic structure and this structure I use and, and uh, I suppose one could say something like what happens to the critical to a critical philosophy once you drop into it, energy and entropy, you know, that would be the, the kind of analogy uh, there, what forms from it. Um, uh, and that's my particular project, you know, that's the, but, you know, we'll, we'll be doing that potentially together as well, you know, what happens to, to, to different structures. I and mean, you could do that, you know, with 
multiple different things. You know, it's not just not just Kantian critical philosophy and thermodynamics. But um, okay, so uh, these are some of the questions um, for today. Um, probably will be there throughout the three weeks. So. Um, Critique of pure plasticity. So I don't know whether anyone else is, you know, this is something that I've kind of uh, been, I am working on at the moment. And this is kind of what is forming through this, through this two pronged structure. Um, and the reason why I've kind of chosen the notion of pure, pure plasticity um, is, and, and plasticity, maybe some of you will know, kind of uh, famously uh, uh, theorized from, from Catherine Malibu to mean something like the giving and taking of form. Or simply transformation. Um, pure, uh, there you can see here is a kind of uh, 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 an allusion to Kant. Um, so, what would pure plasticity be? Pure plasticity would be something like infinite transformation, or, or it would be something like transformation that doesn't understand its own entropic conditions, does not take into consideration its own entropic conditions. Um, it would be a speculative philosophy, much like pure reason is. You know, it would be something which. Uh, which would only be predicated of God, for example. Um, and we'll see, we'll see in a second uh, Nietzsche talking about this. So some of the questions, is transformation finite or infinite? Okay, so um, one way of defining what, what thermodynamics is as a science, particularly you know, classical thermodynamics here, um, is a philosophy of the transformation of energy. Um, so it's how can one energy in, its, in a certain form be transformed and become another form? How can, for example, potential, potential energy become kinetic energy? How can the difference between two temperatures become motion? How can elect electrical differences, for example, also you know, um, become heat? These are all transformations between different energy types. Um, and so in a sense, it is the, the science of transformation. Um, and it says, you know, it says particular things about transformation and what is possible, what isn't possible in regards to transformation. So another question is, uh, and this, I, this is kind of maybe more of an epistemological question, is transformation and change a privileged category in philosophy or not? You know, um, is uh, our process full of philosophies or responses to notions of stasis or particularly metaphysics often, which is seen as, you know, stability, Often we, 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 we try to overcome notions of stability by, by affirming notions of change and transformation or the possibility of change and transformation. But are they privileged over other forms of thinking? Um, do we desire or dream of um, kind of infinite transformation? What are the thermodynamic conditions of transformation? So this is the, this is the kind of scientific questions, you know. Um, uh, but obviously you can kind of see there the, 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 the Kantian uh, notions of conditions of possibility. So you could say, what are the conditions of possibility of transformation? You know, or how does thermodynamics complicate conditions of possibility? Is it a condition of possibility? Is it a condition of impossibility? What does thermodynamics have to say in that regard? This is uh, the next question is, is kind of what I've already been talking about. So um, is there a critical structure of thought that can be transduced from thermodynamics? So this is the, you know, what concepts can we take from it um, that can become philosophical concepts. This is kind of the same question. Um, this one will be. Uh, this question also will kind of loom throughout the three sec the, the three uh, the four the four sessions. So, how do logical categories, so we could call them reflective categories, such as identity, difference, permanence, quantity, quality, relation, modality, alter? In relation to thermodynamics, so in the in the kind of research that I've done on on the, on the reception on the within the science as well as the kind of yeah, the, the philosophic reception, these uh, these problems seem to seem to always kind of pop up. Problems of, of identity. So we'll, we'll look at that in a second. But when you say something like the first law of thermodynamics is energy is always conserved, right? there is a, there is a constant. Uh, of energy in, in the in the universe. Um, if one form of uh, energy transforms into another form of, of energy, there is an equal quantity, right? There's a certain identity of quantity between the two. Um, 
also problems of difference right here precisely built into this problem is well, what remains the same and what is different through transformations right what is qualitatively different between the two um if i have potential and then kinetic energy you know I, I, one is transformed into the other um to what extent is difference presupposed so as we'll go through in a, in a, in a second uh, in a, a bit later the driving or motive uh, force uh, as Kano recognizes is a difference in temperature and difference the is is the is the position from which then identity uh, uh, comes right we have for example a difference of uh, one hot one cold motive force is produced through that difference so difference is presupposed permanence Again, here kind of like uh, uh, folded into the problem of identity. Uh, if energy cannot be created or destroyed, is it substantial? Is it permanent? Right. Um, where does that permanence come from? Who ensures that permanence? And then we've, we've looked at slightly uh, already at those that quantity and quality. So is energy qualitative or is it quantitative? Is entropy a quantity? You know, what is it? Can you actually count it? What is that? Right. Is it, or is it just a qualitative distinction between two types of energy sources? Is it just a qualitative distinction or a qualitatively temporal distinction between energy sources? And then lastly, relation to modality. So in particular, looking at modality, you know, um, is it necessary? I mean, this is the very interesting here. Is it necessary that, entro that entropy increases? Right? These are the kind of things that we've, we've talked about uh, that have been, been spoken about. But... What happens to the necessity of something like a law, or a law of thermodynamics, when then when statistical mechanics says that it's just a probability? Right? Um, is it something certain? Is there a certainty to it? So there is a, the modality of this is very, very interesting. I mean, even I mean, the most obvious one, actually, is the problem of potentiality and actuality. Right? Is, is energy, where is energy when it's potential? Right? Is it not already actual? These are the, the, the I mean, and it, here we, you know, the modality question is really very interesting because especially is the fact that energy uh, derives from energia in, in Aristotle um, and dynamis, you know, dynamics comes from potentiality from Aristotle again. And, and the first ways that these were being grappled with in the 19th century were private, precisely called potential and actual energy um, before actual energy became kinetic energy. But here, modality is a very, very interesting uh, way of thinking about it. Um, the last question here. Um, again, potentially uh, epistemological or, or, or ethical, potentially, or no, it's kind of maybe uh, axiological. Or it's a question of value uh, or resentment, as, as Nietzsche might call it. How is it that entropy has come to mean something that, as Michael Marder puts it in Energy Dreams, we dread, right? Why is there a value judgment made on entropy? Why is it that we dread it, right? Um, this is something, uh, this is the, very interesting to, to certainly to, 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 to me, is why is it, and this is, goes into the, the political economic question, um, why is it that the science of thermodynamics in particular energy, I mean, entropy potentially is because it's more complicated, but why is it that energy was taken up um, by 19th century capitalists? You know, why is the notion of energy extraction spoken about, but entropy not? Right? Why does this kind of, the, the thing that kind of, uh, that stops the engine running, you know, in a certain sense, why is that, why is that dreadful, you know? Um, or why is it pushed to one side or forgotten or feared? Um, these are, you know, we, we can think about this in, in a way uh, as angst or something, the way that, the way that uh, Heidegger wants to talk about death as well. What is our relationship, you know, to death in that respect? Um, what is our response to it? Um, Nietzsche certainly, you know, uh, uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to this right now. So, so Nietzsche certainly was thinking about this you know, um, by uh, by the end of the by the end of the eighties, you know, um, what are what what should our responses be to these to these questions? Um, you know, he, he said something like, "Should we just be Marcus Aurelius? Should we just be a Stoic? You know, and just kind of take it in our stride and, and act as if life has no value or death has no value?" Um, 
how should we we respond to it? You know, can we respond to it? Also, is it is an interesting question? You know, um, uh, particularly when it when it refers to to entropy. So, so that I didn't just uh, just kind of waffle on for too long about those kind of pre preliminary stuff and. And so that this seminar wasn't entirely just uh, giving you a kind of history of the science. I thought I would start here with the last text. Um, uh, so this is, um, these are notes uh, or the Naklas from, uh, from Friedrich Nietzsche's kind of last set of notes um, where he is trying to formulate uh, his He's thinking around the eternal return um, in its relationship to, to, to thermodynamics. So this can be found in, in the, the will to power, which I probably actually say a bit about this later, but it's probably better to say this now. So the will to power is you know, post, posthumously um, edited and published by Nietzsche's sister. Um, and you know, it's produced a lot of um, do you call it a lot of controversy in, in, the kind of, in Nietzsche's scholarship precisely because you know it's a kind of the way that she used it was to try and use this book as the as the kind of philosophical under uh, underpinning the uh, um, national socialism um there's been a lot of work especially in the 19th century by Kaufman by Hollingdale by by um uh Paolo Diori Diorio lots of other Nietzsche scholars um Scaparti to to verify uh, a lot of these notes. Um, so the these what, what, reason why I'm saying that is because these notes are real, they are from Nietzsche, they can be found in his as facsimiles, but whether they were supposed to be part of a, a book that's called Will to Power is uh, is, is kind of the question. I, it probably wasn't supposed to be. That's just a kind of apparent, you know, an important uh, 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 bracket to say about the Will to Power. So you could just call these the, the, the later, later notes from the, the Eternal Return. Okay, so um, I'm going to actually read the, uh, the, these two out because I think that what Nietzsche summarizes in this kind of later note in 1888, he's writing this, um, are some of the main problems, the philosophical problems, and can be it's a, it's a wonderful kind of uh, summary of, um, of precisely kind of some of the questions that I was asking earlier. So. Um, it probably, before I say this, it's probably worth saying, and I'll look at some of this later, that Nietzsche, um, uh, knows of thermodynamics via his reading of, uh, originally his reading of uh, Friedrich Lang, um, and Lang's citations of Helmholtz, um, and, and those are in the kind of the 19, the, the 1870s, when uh, Nietzsche is writing on, on Heraclitus, and other pre-Socratics, although he calls them the pre-Platonics, but um, we then have 1881 when the, the eternal return as an idea is formulated in Sils Maria, and there he's reading people like Otto Kaspari um, and another set, set of uh, uh, scientists as well, philosophers who are kind of dealing with, precisely dealing with thermodynamics. So Nietzsche is actually, you know, these are kind of, uh, this is a very contemporary debate at that point, so it's kind of some, uh, some background. And although many people want to say that the eternal return can only be an ethical or only be some form of kind of philosophical question, you know, um, it's very clear that, that uh, from the notes and from other things that, that Nietzsche is trying to cosmologically prove this uh, mechanically or thermodynamically. You know? So it's, it isn't just an idea, uh, a question or an idea in Nietzsche, it is, it is both. Okay, so if the world has some purpose, This would have uh, this would have to have been achieved already. Were there some unintended final state in store for it, this too would have been achieved already. Were it at all capable of being, of remaining stationary, or arriving at a steady state, if it had possessed this capacity this capacity for being even if only for a moment in the course of its development, then all development would have long since come to an end, along with, along with all thinking and all intellect. 
The fact that intell the intellect develops over time proves that the world has no purpose, no final state, and is thus incapable of being. However, the old habit of thinking of things in the light of their purposes, of thinking of the world in terms of divine creation and guidance is so powerful that the thinker has to be careful not to think that the world's very failure to achieve any purpose is itself intentional. This idea that the world intentionally evades achieving any purpose and even devises expedients to avoid falling into a cycle inevitably occurs to all those who would like to insist upon the world's boundless capacity for innovation. In other words, the finite determinate energy of invariable magnitude that is the world possesses the wondrous facility for infinitely reconfiguring its forms and states. The world is supposed to be capable of divine creative power, an infinite power of transformation. Even if God no longer is, it is supposed to prevent itself of its own accord, on its, of its own accord from falling back into one of its earlier forms. It is supposed to have not only the intention, but also the means of guarding itself from any repetition. And thus, as every moment, it is supposed to monitor each of its movements to avoid achieving any purposes, arriving at final states or initiating any repetitions and whatever else may follow from such inexclusively preposterous reasoning and wishful thinking. This is just the persistence of earlier religious reasoning and wishful thinking, a kind of longing to believe that somewhere or other, in some, in some way or other, the world is the same as the old, beloved, infinite and limitlessly creative God after all. And in some way or other, the old God still lives. After all, that longing of Spinoza's, which expressed itself in the words, dear sive natura, he even experienced it in the form of natura sive deus. However, what proposition and belief provides the most definitive formulation of the decisive turning point, the present ascendancy of the spirit of science over the spirit of religion that creates fictitious gods? Is it not that the energy of the world may not be thought unlimited because it is unthinkable, that we forbid ourselves the concept, the concept of an infinite energy because it is incompatible with the concept energy? from which it follows that the world lacks even the capacity for boundless innovation. So before uh, I kind of uh, take a step back and kind of you know, go through the history, the brief history of, uh, of thermodynamics itself, the development of, of energy as a concept, of entropy as a concept. Um, oh, so I'll leave these up. Okay, so. What is fascinating, I think, about these, uh, about uh, in particular this note, um, 1062, is that Nietzsche is, is precisely grappling with the, the cosmological and the philosophical problems of, of, of energy uh, and entropy, and something that will come to be known as heat death, uh, the heat death of the universe, which we'll look at also briefly today. So, when he talks about a final state, this final state in store for, for, for the universe, this is finally this kind of, this notion of the heat death, where, whereby no more, where no more machines, nothing, uh, actually Rankin, I think, says something, calls it, no more phenomena or existence will be possible. Um, uh, this is what he's talking about. And his argument uh, is that, well, if some form of final state was at all possible and, and time is infinite, then we would have already arrived at this final state. So his argument uh, kind of strangely, uh, maybe doesn't quite work logically, but his, his argument is that we would have already, uh, we would have already be finished. If finishing was, you know, if to finish was possible, we would already have already finished if time is infinite. Um, but what he also, uh, I mean, in, hidden in here is also is that he, he thinks that the, the eternal return of the same is the answer uh, to, uh, to, to kind of avoiding this final state. So if we think of the eternal return as a way of avoiding uh, this final state, this coming into being. The other thing that the eternal return is also trying to avoid, and I think this is really, really very interesting, um, is the eternal return is precisely formulated as, as an attempt to try and avoid, avoid uh, um, falling back into the metaphysical assumption that comes with infinite creativity or infinite transformation, um, infinite novelty, as he calls it. 
um, this capacity for 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 an infinite amount of reconfigurations of forms. Right. Um, we might call this something like uh, you know infinite creative difference or something. Um, but it's certainly not too far from the notion of difference uh, in 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 Deleuze. Um, What's also very interesting about these uh, final notes is that they are very definitively counter uh, to Deleuze's own readings of, of Nietzsche. So Deleuze's reading is that the uh, eternal return is the eternal return of, of difference. Certainly something here that Nietzsche would say would be something, uh, would be just falling back into the old wishful thinking of an infinitely creative God. So. These are the two things that the eternal return is trying to avoid. It's trying to avoid infinite creativity. It's also trying to uh, avoid this notion of a, a final state or, or heat death. Um, and he believes that this is possible. And, and we'll look at this at the end. He believes this is possible because of the first law of thermodynamics, that, that, that the energy of the, uh, um, of the universe is constant. So that the all transformations, regardless of uh, what, they, what energy transforms into, the quantity of that is the same. Right? There is no uh, deus ex machina, as, as Descartes would call it, that, that uh, starts the universe or that, um, or that can somehow add uh, energy into it. What is interesting also here uh, within Nietzsche is that, um, and this is you know, one of the earliest uh, works on, on, the, on 1907 by a French, uh, French philosopher called André Fouillet talks about is that is that you know what, what, what happens to entropy then you know um, in, in Nietzsche's conception um, he even talks about it Fouillet talks about it as a kind of troubling Nietzsche as, as it, it c'est gênant for for Nietzsche it's uh, problematic or it not embarrasses but it kind of you know puts a spanner in the works you might say of his eternal return and these are certainly questions that you know I've kind of asked been asking myself you know is is and you know, lots of people are not just uh, uh, to respond to is the eternal return you know, scientifically possible? But the questions are, you know, why does Nietzsche continue to insist on the eternal return despite uh, uh, entropy or despite problems of, of heat death? I mean, here you have one answer is this is trying to avoid final states, but you know, these are kind of open questions potentially. Okay, where are we? Okay, so um, we are now going to do a brief overview of the of the science itself, because um, maybe none of this made any sense to you. So um, it doesn't know if it. Okay, this should hopefully. Uh, you know, serve uh, for lots of the readings. The the reason also why I set the um, the Helmholtz text uh, on the interactions of forces is, is is because it's actually an excellent introduction also to the history of the nineteenth in the nineteenth century. Well, obviously up until up until fifty four when he when he gives the lecture, but it's a very very good um, uh, summary or history of of, uh, of the science itself. Another very good history, if, if people want, or an early history, is by Tate called Sketch of Thermodynamics. Sketch of Thermodynamics, published in 1877, um, which is actually the first time that thermodynamics, this is very interesting that how the first his, history of thermodynamics is the first time that thermodynamics is called thermodynamics um, without, the, uh, without the, the hyphen in between it. So uh, you found it, <laughs> it's that thing where history is always, you know, it's, uh, um, it, will, you know, it's always, it always names that which it thinks has gone before it, but it's only really kind of invents it in the very moment in which it's giving its own history. But there you go. Um, prior to that, it was called many different things. Um, thermodynamics was used as an adjective, but with a with a hyphen. But it, yeah, it isn't till 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 eighteen seventy seven or whatever it is. I think it's eighteen seventy seven that thermodynamics becomes thermodynamics in its own history. So there. Yeah, so okay, so thermodynamics was historically developed in the nineteenth century. Uh, following the already existent uh, science of heat. So heat or the caloric or, uh, was already a, a science uh, study of heat. Um, understood though as a substance itself called the caloric. So that's what kind of does get uh, epistemologically overturned um, and classical mechanics. So um, classical mechanics 
many people in classical mechanics, but the three biggest are Newton, Leibniz, and Descartes. Obviously, Newton being the most famous, how uh, classical mechanics is often just called Newtonian mechanics. Um, uh, this is kind of, um, this is, thermodynamics kind of, uh, is the first major rupture to, to classical, uh, to classical mechanics. Um, many come actually around this particular time because obviously you, you you have the kind of the foundation you have the founding of quantum mechanics towards the end of the 19th century beginning of the 20th century obviously you have relativity general relativity special general relativity um information there's lots of things coming in at the end of the 19th century you know so um um by lots of the many the similar people but um what's important actually i think about thermodynamics is that it, it's, it's it is that it is that it starts to name things different conceptually name things different um, and that's very important. And then to a certain extent, we are very much still in this paradigm. Right? We still talk of energy, right? we still talk of entropy. Um, of course, we still talk of force. I mean, we have fundamental forces. I mean, it's not to say that that is completely, uh, certainly not been completely uh, removed from, from the paradigm. And I mean, this is kind of a mathematical uh, oddity, but the reason why kinetic energy still has the half over it is because of the integration of momentum into uh, kinetic energy so obviously <laughs> classical mechanics is still there and, um, but it is the first major uh, paradigm shift that, that comes um, in classical mechanics you know the problems are the relationship between force forces bodies moving bodies uh, gravity obviously the kind of the most one of the most famous uh, well not fam just famous but kind of the most important terms and uh, theorizations that occurs uh, velocity and momentum as well um, the differences between those two and the notion of the conservation of momentum, which is very important, obviously, for, for, for Newton. Um, in Leibniz as well, I mean, Leibniz very, I think, probably more of uh, the, more of a uh, kind of forefather of, uh, of thermodynamics in, insofar as one of the great debates was the difference between the conservation of momentum and conservation of vis viva, this notion of living force. Um, uh, and the vis viva, the kind of mathematical formula for the vis viva, is almost identical to to that of what then becomes kinetic energy. Um, it doesn't have the half precisely, but this is the. Um, um, so one could say that Leibniz is the kind of uh, you know slightly the forefather in it to a certain extent. Um, what's also very very interesting, I think, and the most important, uh, I would say, uh, philosophical or metaphysical. Um, characteristic of uh, classical mechanics is the notion of reversibility. Um, and this is uh, this is something that, that uh, writers like Isabel Stengers and um, Prigogine um, really highlight um, when they, in their, you know, many of their writings, in particular in, in, uh, in uh, Order Out of Chaos, is that what happens uh, with the rise of thermodynamics is that you move from a universe which is perfectly reversible, perfect, perfectly mechanical, insofar as cause and effect are to a certain extent timeless. Um, every course has a kind of equal effect, an opposing force. Um, every force has an opposing force, which can be understood in Newton's third law for every action you must have done. Do this is school. For every action, force in nature, there's an equal and opposing reaction. So if object A exerts force on object B, object B also exerts an equal and an opposite force on object A. So this, this notion of kind of reciprocal uh, relation between forces is reversible. Um, in that respect, the notion of time uh, is very difficult to talk about in uh, classical mechanics. Of course, it's there, but it's there is a certain indifference um, to these reactions, uh, particularly from a temporal uh, respect. This is also something that, that Reichenbach also uh, highlights um, in his book on the direction of time is that within mechanics, you have order, uh, you have reversible orders, but you don't necessarily have a direction, uh, you don't necessarily have a past or a, or a future. Um, you just have a difference in position, if you will. Um, and uh, this is what is over time. So, Irreversibility, um, and I don't necessarily actually talk so much about that, but irreversibility, I didn't use that as a concept in this one, but irreversibility, we'll look at that when Sklar talks about it, cosmology and irreversibility. Irreversibility um, 
is is the is is the concept that starts to be, or maybe the the kind of the framework in which thermodynamics uh, uh, disrupts is that which disrupts the most um, classical mechanics. Right? So for so it would seem with the rise of thermodynamics that history or temporality um, arrives uh, uh, within within mathematics or within within physics right? more particularly. Okay, so what, how do we move then um, from classical mechanics to thermodynamics? What is what is that? Um, so it's it's mostly in relation to the problem of heat. So if, for example, um, I were to, uh, and we'll talk about some of the experiments because some of them are very interesting. Um, if I were to lift a very, very heavy ball up, uh, I won't go through all of the maths, all of the things, but if I lift a very, very heavy ball up uh, and then drop it, um, and the material isn't elastic enough for it to, to, to bounce back up, because then it becomes ob more obvious the, 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 the kind of the equivalence of the force. Um, but if I drop a very, very heavy, heavy ball and it hits the ground, it does displace, you know, potentially some, uh, some of the matter. Um, well, the questions start to arise, well, where, what happens to that force? Where does that force go, right? Um, does it disappear? You know? I thought, we thought within, uh, within mechanics, you know, that, that all forces were supposed to be reciprocal. They were supposed to be an equally resistant force um, to it. But it seems as though that, that momentum at least, momentum at least stops, right? Is it conserved? So the answer to that question, and I, I suppose I'm kind of jumping to, 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 to to, to it is that heat is generated. So if you drop a very, very heavy ball and it seems to go nowhere, well, what's happened is that the, 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 that force, which was kinetic energy, has heated or gone into the very medium which it hits and has heated it slightly. So the movement, so it hasn't disappeared, it's just transformed, it's transformed into heat. Um, and the, 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 the transition from classical mechanics into thermodynamics occurs around the end of the, the 18th century with precisely trying to determine whether there is inequality or between heat and mechanical force. Um, this, is, uh, this is achieved um, importantly by uh, a set of different uh, scientists, in particular my favourite is, is Count Rumford in 1798 in his observations of, of the heat generation of boring cannons. Um, so I think I've got, yeah, here's, here's, the, here's the, the picture of it. So when people were boring cannons, they recognized that, uh, that uh, the metal, when they were boring, <laughs> um, heated up, right? Um, and that therefore there seemed to be some form of, of uh, relation between mechanical movement or motive power um, and heat itself, or even the generation of heat itself. Um, this was proved by Rumford um, by, by, by this experiment whereby there was a kind of chamber of water um, and the, uh, the cannon was, was bored backwards and forwards, was moved backwards and forwards. And the, through the friction between uh, the, the boring element and the, the cannon that was being bored itself, heat was generated and uh, managed to boil the water in which you can see the, the, the square at the bottom, that's where the container of the water was, managed to boil the water. From this, uh, Rumford uh, managed to, to uh, equate the amount of uh, work done or the amount of force needed, mechanical force needed to boil uh, water or to raise water up one, uh, uh, um, one degree Celsius. From this, one can deduce therefore that the mechanical, uh, uh, that motion, or, um, mechanical energy can produce heat, right? So there must be some form of equivalence. Um, very, very important for this also was uh, Joule in, in, in Britain and Davy. These also, um, these also, these also concluded that there is, a, there is an equivalence um, between um, 
mechanical and uh, and uh, mechanical or motive force and heat. So once you start to recognize that there is some sort of relationship between mechanics, uh, between forces, bodies, and heat, there is the need for further investigation into the relationship between, between those. That is essentially what the birth of thermodynamics is. It's, it's the questioning of the relationship between heat and force, thermodynamics. Um, the most important uh, figure um, in this transition um, is a very, very interesting, um, very young military student called um, Sadi Carnot. Sadi Carnot um, at the Polytechnic in Paris in 1824 um, wrote a book called The Reflections on uh, Oh, goodness. Reflections on, where is it? Reflections of the motive power of fire, of, of fire du feu, um, which would become, uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a second, will become the, the very founding text of thermodynamics. It's, in, it's actually an amazing text. It's not very, not particularly long. He, he's using still the paradigm of, of caloric theory. So for him, heat is still a kind of element, a substance that is moved or transformed uh, between substances. So it's, Obviously, it's the founding text, so, so the, you know, there isn't the set, the paradigm hasn't been built yet, if you will. But certainly, we can see the germs of the, of the building of, of the particular paradigm that will become thermodynamics. Uh, and within that text, Kansadikano's text, there are very, very uh, clear early descriptions of what could be called the first and the second laws of thermodynamics. It's in particular, the, and we'll get to this in a second, it's particular the way in which motive power is produced through heat. That becomes the key to the foundation of, of, of thermodynamics uh, and produces all of the problems, the philosophical problems, the categorical problems that, that will follow. Um, before we look at that very quickly, I want to have a look at this. And I, and I think this is very, very interesting. Uh, it's the way that Helmholtz uh, formulates this, I think is very, very interesting. So in the, in the text that was set and in interactions of the forces, um, 1884. So this text, the text by Carnot, is written in 1824. Uh, he's very, very young. He dies young. Uh, it's published. Um, the only thing he publishes, um, it's picked up about 20 years later in the in the 1840s by a French physicist called Clapeyron, who you know, it's like, wow, this is this this <laughs> this genius boy has written uh, uh, this kind of uh, you know this foundational kind of thinking, and and uh, he starts to write on it. Um, it is also picked up by by Jules, uh, Jules. Sorry, I know why I'm saying that with the, the French accent. By Jules, it in uh, and who also finds it very very fascinating as well. And it's the it's the combination of Jules, Jules and and, and Clapeyron that starts then this kind of uh, this interpretive this interpretive kind of uh, back and forth of Carnot's uh, Carnot's text, which is absolutely fascinating to see this kind of. Um, this interpretive work by scientists where they are trying to understand together um, a particular text by an author that has already died. Um, it's, a, it's a very, epistemologically or for the history of science, it's very, very interesting, the way that this, this text kind of uh, uh, is so important, the way that it's read. Um, okay, so the way that Helmholtz phrases what Kano does, and I think is, is also very, very interesting philosophically too. too. So, um, and, and as you would notice, the beginning, or if, you, if you've managed to read it, the beginning of Helmholtz's um, text is a lot about perpetual motion. Um, so one of the most kind of important uh, refutations that occurs through some thermodynamics is specifically the refutation of, of perpetual motion. So the capacity for a motor to continue itself uh, without energy added. Um, is, there are different types, but... Um, so that's what perpetual motion refers to. And this is, uh, this is what Helmholtz says about, about, about Carnot, um, or the way that kind of reformulates the question, the scientific epistemological question. So, but warm, warned by the futility of former experiments, the public had become wiser. This is about perpetual motion. On the whole, people did not seek much 
after combinations which promised to furnish a perpetual motion. But the question was inverted, right? It was no more asked, how can I make use of the known and unknown relation, relations of natural forces so as to construct a perpetual motion? But it was asked, if a perpetual motion be impossible, what are the relations which must subsist between natural forces? Everything was gained by this inversion of the question. And I think that that is it's so beautifully put. It's, for me, it's, it's the difference between what one might call a dogmatic question and a critical question in the Kantian framework. So no more was it asked, I and mean, that's not true because you now we're gonna look at, uh, you know, perpetual motion machines are still being sent through to the US Patent Office all the time. Um, but the, the, the important question, this is what Carnot does, and it's very, very interesting, is he no longer says, well, what has to be the case in the world? What known or unknown relations or laws of the world what, uh, have to be the case so that I may construct a perpetual motion machine, right? Um, this kind of desire, if you will, for infinite transformation, um, how would the world have to be such so that perpetual motion is possible, is turned on its head, right? And if you will, it's that the first is dogmatic. It, it, it re remains speculative, or remains incredibly <laughs> metaphysical. The second, however, becomes critical. If this is such that it is impossible, what then are the uh, the relations, right? Um, it's uh, th th that inversion of the question is is incredibly important. Right? Um, if it is such the case that you know uh, no perpetual motion, put into Kantian words, if it is such the case that no perpetual motion machine can be experienced, right? What then are the relations within experience that make that so impossible, right? It's, very, very similar to the Kantian dialectic there between the analytic and the dialectic. Right? If God, the world, all of these infinite ideas are impossible, why is that so? And the analytic is, is precisely that, right? What is the conditions of possibility of experience? And the, those conditions of the possibility of experience are that which makes <laughs> uh, experience of God or the infinite impossible. Um, there you go. So that's kind of my little thing on, 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 uh, on that inversion of the question, but it's, uh, it's very, very important. Okay, so Kano, Kamu, Teddy Kamu. Um, okay, so uh, as I said, this uh, the transition into thermodynamics occurs via. Uh, it's questioning the relationship between heat and motive power. Um, you could say heat and force, if you want, uh, or, uh, or heat and momentum, probably more accurately. What is also, I think, also interesting, I think this is very important as well to, to think about kind of historically, um, is that steam engines um, were already uh, being used. So what's uh, steam engines um, up throughout to the, the um, uh, all through to the, to the, the 19th century were, were already being, already being, already in operation. Um, so what are called heat engines or, or, or um, it's just steam engines, I suppose, but it's, 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 it's the creation of motive power through uh, heat. The, the technology as such, was already in operation. What's also interesting about that is it's it's one of the interesting cases whereby um, and we now often talk about notions of kind of techno science, right? The kind of relationship between science and, and technology, or the invention of particular uh, techniques. In the case of thermodynamics, uh, the the technology was already there. Um, in a way, we were already using heat in order to produce power. Um, it just hadn't been fully theorized yet. Um, and why, in a way, it was already known, but it hadn't been theorized either. So what Sadikano does, um, and here we can talk about interesting about technical knowledge and then epistemological knowledge or, or the difference between technical and scientific knowledge and it's, it's or theoretical knowledge, very interesting. But what Sadikano does in, in, uh, in in the re reflections on the motive power of fire is precisely talk about, about engines, right? Steam engines. And the, if you want the, the very kind of 
technological uh, example that is always used in thermodynamics is a piston, right? A piston is the, is the technology of thermodynamics. In classical thermodynamics, it is this piston, right? It is the movement, uh, the creation of movement through the expansion of, uh, of, of water into, into vapor. Just expansion of steam, water into steam. Um, what Carnot does and what Carnot's principle kind of states is, is as follows. So wherever there exists a difference of temperature, motif power can be produced. Reciprocally, wherever we can consume this power, it is possible to produce a difference of temperature. It is possible to occasion destruction of equilibrium in the caloric. I'll read the next bit as well, because it kind of goes with it. The production of motive power is then due in steam engines, not to an actual consumption of caloric, but to its transportation from a warm body to a cold body. That is to its reestablishment of equilibrium, an equilibrium considered as destroyed by any cause whatsoever, by chemical action such as combustion or by any other. We shall see shortly that this principle is applicable to any machine set in motion by heat. So this this is what this is what Carnot's principle uh, is. Um, it's that wherever there exists a difference of temperature, motive power can be produced, and that it can only be produced through the transportation of a warm body to a cold body. So uh, motive power cannot be produced from uh, transfer from the transfer of heat from a cold body uh, to a hot body. Right? Um, Importantly as well, the, the notion of le principe de Carnot, Carnot, Carnot's principle, Carnot's principle, this is the first, if you will, uh, terminological statement for, for, the, for entropy, for the second law of thermodynamics, uh, in a certain extent, to a certain extent. Um, so you will see in many of the texts uh, that when, when one talks of Carnot's principle, one is talking about the second law often, and not necessarily the conservation of energy. Um, so often the, these are the, we was said next to each other the conservation of energy and Carnot's principle. This is prior to, to Clausius um, in, in in 1865, you know, uh, terming or coining uh, entropy. So we have this notion of Carnot's principle. So often when it's talking about this, is what it's what it, what it is referring to, or people are using it as a synonym uh, for that. So we'll, we'll have a little reflection on, 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 uh, on what that kind of says in a second. So <laughs> maybe leave you with that kind of, uh, that, that thought, that it's the, that difference in temperature is the condition of possibility of motive power. So, um, and that that difference becomes destroyed, right? Uh, that there is only a one, kind of a one way tendency of, of the movement from hot to cold. The other very important thing that Carnot uh, theorizes is called Carnot's cycle. Um, and what this theorizes is the, uh, the perfect engine. Um, the engine which is the most uh, efficient. Right? Um, and I will bring this up here so that you can have a, a kind of... Uh... So at the end of uh, Carnot's book, small books about 65 pages he he includes these figures which aren't particularly uh it is still not that useful but it's um uh, i've tried to make it a little bit more useful by putting a and b here so the Carnot cycle which is the this perfect engine um the importance of 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 this uh, i think is that is that what what kind of does is he um uh, he precisely idealizes um efficiency so what is perfect efficiency yeah what is a perfect engine? Um, and what does that then say you know, about a world in which this essentially can't occur because it's an idealized state? That's, the, that's what's interesting. So the perfect engine essentially is whereby we have um, a piston, um, we have some water. I mean, this is, you know, we could think about this other than just using pistons, but pistons is the best way of thinking about it. Um, we have a piston enclosed 
in a, uh, uh, say, a tube. Um, we have some water at the bottom. Um, and that water is heated by a warm body that is infinitely hot and always stays at the same temperature. Right? What we see is that the, the temperature of the water that is in the piston or underneath the piston is lower than the temperature um, of, the, of the body. Through the transfer of heat from body A into the water underneath the piston, the piston rises. Right? We have a, a decrease in pressure and an increase in volume that derives from the transfer of heat from the heat source, body A. Piston is then at the top. What then occurs is that we then put a, a cold reservoir, a cold body underneath that. What then happens is the heat from the, that was in the steam that is, in the, the, in the, that is underneath the piston then becomes transferred to the cold sink, to the water sink. The piston then drops. Is then arrived back to the position it was prior to leaving. In order then for the cycle to recontinue, one then has to put another hot body underneath. I mean, this is the essentially the 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 the, uh, the structure of, of of all heat engines, right? All heat engines um, derive through this difference. And so, the perfect efficiency, perfect engine, occurs when there is no friction, there is no uh, matter or energy that, that goes into uh, the, the engine where the water is and that body A is infinitely hot and body B is infinitely cold. Right? That is the perfect engine. Now, what is important about that is that that is not the case. Right? Um, there is not an infinitely hot source and there is not an infinitely cold source. That difference, the difference between uh, body A and body B is reduced through, uh, through the, the, the conversion of that, or that transfer of, of heat um, into, the, uh, into the water, right? Um, and it is that precisely that what we call then comes to be called dissipation of energy um, or the transformational content. The fact that that difference then becomes divided by the temperature at the end that we come to be called, or the equalization of the temperature comes to be called entropy. So, uh, let's move. This is, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll have a little look at the, the, uh, the, the philosophical assumptions that are put into this first, but I actually strangely put into here just very quickly um, an application um, that was, Given in two thousand, basically, what the what the Carnot cycle does is it kind of proves the impossibility um, of perpetual motion unless you have an infinite heat sink and uh, an infinite cold sink, um, and uh, just to say that regardless also of Helmholtz kind of uh, chiding, I suppose, of people that continue to, to try and find perpetual motion, um, there are there are there are the continuation of, of people that do try and. Uh, get these patented, you know, this is one in 2007. This is a picture of, of someone trying to produce a perpetual motion machine. Um, of course, uh, it was the application started in 2006. It was then abandoned uh, because of course um, it is impossible. Um, <laughs> but this is this doesn't stop people trying trying nonetheless. I mean, a very, before we kind of look to the, the, the kind of philosophical problems actually of, uh, of what Carno is saying, um, the, the history of perpetual motion itself is an absolutely fascinating history to kind of take a step back. I mean, it is really one of, uh, of in, in Helmholtz text, he talks about it actually being related to the kind of capitalist drive of America. And that's why so many people are trying to do it, in, trying to produce them in America, because this idea of somehow making something from nothing, the way that, I mean, this is precisely the same, the same uh, structure as capitalism, right? Capitalism produces capital. It thinks it produces capital from nothing, um, but precisely forgets that the labor power is, is, is the thing that it's, that it's exploiting. Um, but the, uh, yeah, so, you know, there, there is a, still a continued stream of perpetual motion machines that are, uh, I actually haven't taken the time to try and understand the way that Mr. McDonald's, um, Mr. Paul Wayne McDonald's tries to work, but it's a, it's a fascinating history nonetheless. But one of the, I couldn't find a picture of it, but one of the most amazing ones is this, 
is was kind of at the end of the 19th century this guy that would um that would kind of tour his perpetual motion machine um and and kind of get people to pay tickets to come and see it um but he had someone up just i can't remember i think one of the things was in a roof or behind the the stage and he was just had someone you know going going like this uh um, to ensure that the wheel kept on going. I think that's a, probably a very, very good analogy for capitalism insofar as what it thinks is the internal perpetual motion is, is actually labor extended or expended external to it, um, which is hidden often, um, particularly, particularly uh, uh, since, the, since the, the expanse of uh, advanced capitalism and, and colonialism. But okay, so we'll, uh, other than perpetual motion machines, let's have a look at, um, so this problem, the problem of difference and identity. So I said, we might want to pause for a moment um, in the history. So, um, so what is at stake in Carnot's principle and this cycle kind of philosophically speaking? So what, what logical concepts and structures are at play? Um, you know, if this is the founding text of thermodynamics, what paradigm is being built here? You know, um, I think the first one of the first things that comes to be understood is this relationship, but I think it's very interesting, is the relationship between identity, equalization, the re-establishment re-establishment of equality or, or, or and differentiation and difference. Um, what uh, Kano is essentially saying is that the world is such that differences in temperature tend to equalize, and that this tendency is the cause of motion. Right? So uh, I mean, interestingly, that this is just a kind of, you know, all it starts off as is a kind of local uh, investigation into why pistons move or why steam engines move. But the the paradigm or the, the problems that it opens up are, are, are you know, uh, are absolutely incredible. If, if, if for example, uh, the, the mechanical, classical mechanical world just sort of says, well, the world is such and it is like that, it is reversible. Right? There is there is this kind of reciprocal relation between forces and bodies, uh, the stars will continue to, to, to orbit, um, the earth will continue to orbit the, the sun, the sun will stay there, you know, um, there's no sort of death of the sun, um, there is no history or temporal relationship uh, or uh, structure to the universe. What this opens up is, well, why is there that difference, right? Why is there a difference in temperature? And what happens once that difference of temperature becomes identical? Right? So if we have those two bodies, uh, you know, not in this idealized notion of the cycle, if we have body A and body B at different temperatures and we use that to derive work, or we just allow them uh, to come into, into contact and they then equalize their temperatures, right? There is no way right, of increasing the temperature or using the work that we've just used to raise that temperature without a uh, a uh, without exhausting another difference in temperature because motive power can only be uh, 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 can only derive from that difference. Right? So the problem is 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 opens up is well okay are we moving then from a state of whereby the universe is structured such that there are differences in temperature to a world whereby all of those differences will be exhausted. Right? Um, is it such that the that the energy of the world um, will become fully dissipated? Um, what this you know this kind of this uh, this first forgotten text in, in the 1824 opens up is 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 uh, is quite mind-boggling. You know, it kind of opens up the very problem of the beginning and the ending of the universe. It it uh, it opens up the problem of uh, of you know exhaustion. Uh, history, temporality, it's, it's really quite amazing, this, what would seem like quite an interesting, but just a very banal kind of local problem. Oh yeah, you need a difference in temperatures in order to produce motive, motive power, but what it opens up is, is, is quite amazing. So, um, the, we're now kind of really entering into, and I realize we've only got maybe half an hour, but we, you know, We'll get to we'll get to some other texts other than just the history in, in a second. So, um, what this this movement or this tendency uh, opens up is the problem of what then is called by uh, uh, one of the most important figures in this history by by William Thompson, or comes to be called Lord Lord Kelvin, is the dissipation of energy. 
and the equivalence of this dissipation with mechanical motion. Um, so it, it would seem as though it's that this that this difference, right? That this this movement, if you will, this transfer to use the proper terminology of of heat from one body to another, right, occurs through dissipation. Right? And that this dissipation, this tendency, this movement is the cause of motive power. Right? And not only is it the cause of motive power, it is also the cause of the impossibility of reusing that dissipation. Right? So it seems to produce in itself both a condition of possibility and strangely impossibility at the same time, temporarily speaking. Right? Um, I uh, I personally uh, prefer in classical in classical mechanic, uh, classical thermodynamics to talk about precisely this 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 tendency as a dissipation. I think it's lots of uh, educators of science have have uh, come to come to agree that the that the notion of disorder, um, uh, which which come, becomes also uh, analogous to, to entropy slightly later, in particular in Boltzmann, is slightly, um, it doesn't necessarily help to grasp what is at, is at stake. We'll talk about that more next week when Boltzmann comes up, but the, I think dissipation, especially when we're talking about uh, thermodynamics, this, not necessarily just statistical mechanics, dissipation is the most, I would say probably conceptually accurate or the most conceptually useful. Um, it means that at once both a spreading um, as well as a kind of ending. So there's this, this notion that uh, what, is, what is related to the ending is this spreading, or the spreading is the ending. So the, I think that's a very, uh, uh, a very useful way of talking about it. Um, there is a whole stream. One thing that's very interesting in thermodynamics is a whole stream of concepts that essentially mean the same thing. Um, so and we'll look at those uh, as we go along. Entropy, for example, transformation of content, dissipation, um, available energy, neg entropy. Ex I mean, there are there are hundred energy. There are so many that that mean something slightly different, but kind of mean the same thing. Okay, so um, in eighteen fifty two. Um, the uh, William Thompson wrote um, this text called "On a Universal Tendency in Nature to the Dissipation of Mechanical Energy." Um, in this text, um, it is the first time that some of the things that I was talking about prior—that is to say, how is it that this seemingly, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, banal statement about the difference in temperature um, can come to mean something that is so cosmologically important? It is Thompson that first uh, that first starts to, to to speak about this, you know, about the okay. Well, if if it is the such that um, you know, now actually I'll read this. Uh, this this is a quote from him. So um, there is at present in the material world a universal tendency to the dissipation of mechanical energy. Two, any restoration of mechanical energy without more than an equivalent of dissipation is impossible in inanimate material processes and is probably never affected by means of organized matter, either endowed with vegetable life or subjected to the will of any animated creature. Within a finite period of time past the earth, um, past, the earth must have been, and within a finite period of time to come, the earth must, have be, must again be unfit for the habitation of man as at present constituted, unless operations have been or are to be performed, which are impossible under the laws to which the known operations going on at present in the material world are subject. So this, this is the, the first time that, that, you know, that we have this, uh, we have this stretching of the concept. Interestingly enough, all of this happens even prior to the notion of entropy being even coined. So entropy is coined in, in, in 1865 by Clausius. The discussions about, this is essentially what's called the heat death of the universe. Uh, this idea that, you know, if, uh, if any restoration of mechanical energy, that more than an equivalent dissipation is impossible, right? Um, in an inanimate, and it so happens that it's also in, in organic matter as well, um, you know, can't, we, if we can't get the engine, if the engine or the cycle, 
the, the cannot uh, theorize is idealized and perfect. If we can't produce that in a non-idealized you know, uh, world, then it just so happens that the world will move, ten, the tendency will move to a point whereby there will be no more differences and therefore restoration will become impossible and therefore all motive power will become impossible. And therefore, if motive power is also the condition for life or for habitation, that also becomes impossible. So this is the, you know, this is the big thought, if you will. This is the, this is the, the end state that, that Nietzsche talks about, right? Um, and it's absolutely fascinating that Thompson does this here, you know, with, uh, and Helmholtz talks about this. It's like, he says something like, with only this one small book written by this, like this young, um, now past French uh, 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 soldier, uh, Thompson manages to somehow uh, speculate, you know, and deduce this, uh, this idea. This, this is, uh, you know, for, for me, probably one of the, the most important uh, problems still in thermodynamics. Um, many people continue to try and prove that, uh, that, that heat death is something that uh, is impossible, um, both scientifically and theologically. Um, for example, um, uh, Thompson and, and uh, Tate in, in 1866 uh, write a book called The Invisible, what is it? The Invisible, I can't remember the second bit now. It is essentially saying, well, this proves theology, this proves God, right? Um, there's this kind of linear relation relation where the universe must have started at some point. You know, that must be, as I said, started by God. It must be God that is this ex machina that started entropy or created these differences. Um, and then we have this point where the, you know, the judgment comes at the end, right? Um, highly theological uh, idea. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's precisely that, that that Nietzsche is wary of, actually. Um, but you know, my question is, can we think about this non-theologically? Is that possible? Um, okay. Um, Again, um, just very quickly, I think it's also very interesting to, or very you know, interesting to, to say that often these uh, the history is quite you know higgledy piggledy as we say. It's very it's not linear either. You know, as I said, even the notion of thermodynamics as a name doesn't come until its history is written. Right, entropy, for example, here we'll see the citation from Clausius. Entropy as a term is coined in 1865 over 10 years after the first thought of, of heat death is, is formulated. Many people think that heat death is something that is something that, you know, that it, it's kind of the application of entropy to the notion of cosmology, but it's it's almost the other way around in a, in a weird way, it's, it's, it's mutual. Um, it's the notion of dissipation in, in, in Thompson was theorized at the same time as, as this universal uh, uh, problem. Um, and this, I mean, this uh, this picks up on, on lots of the stuff that we'll, that we'll be looking at. You know, is 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 can we apply these? You know, at a, at a grand scale, is there a difference between local and general? Right? Is the universe generally entropic, locally non-entropic? Uh, are we just in a small part of the universe where it just so happens that the this tendency is a movement from hot to cold? Are there other parts in the universe? Where it moves from cold to hot. Right? These are all ways that, that scientists at this particular time were thinking and still start to think. You know? um, two of the main, uh, uh, while we're still on heat death, two of the main kind of responses to it. Um, one that that uh, that was debunked. Uh, it's still actually interesting. That's still the most likely. Um, of course, we can't. This is the this is the Kantian, you know, we, uh, problem is, is we could never experience it. <laughs> it is quite, in and of itself, it is the absolute limit point of any experience. Therefore, it cannot be observed and therefore it cannot be uh, affirmed, right? Um, it's the problem. And that's in that, in that way, it always remains as an idea. Um, this is the, this is in particular, the way that I, I try to think of it is that it is a regulating idea. It unifies um, the universe in a certain extent negatively but it is certainly not something that can be affirmed. Um, it limits, or it, it's the only impossibility of its affirmation is written into it. That's the end of all possible existence. Um, but three, actually three recent attempts to try and uh, uh, debunk it uh, scientifically. One, uh, the most, one that, was, that was overridden in, in about 19, end of the 19, 1990s was that there would be something called a, a big crunch whereby gravity would, would uh, over 
uh, uh, would override the expansion of the universe. Um, dark energy, there would be a, a, a disproportionate relationship between those two and entropy, entropy would kind of be lowered by the, uh, the implosion of the universe, something which is called the big crunch idea. Um, this was debunked by recognizing that the acceleration of the expansion of the universe is too fast for that to occur. Um, so the other is that uh, the universe potentially has a kind of mirrored universe that's called the Janus head point that was recently um, it's by someone called Barber that was recently uh, published only a couple of years ago. And then the, the third, which is that in quantum, mechanic, in quantum mechanics, energy is understood more as an excitation within a field. And so you have fluctuations within a field. And therefore it's possible that there would be fluctuations uh, towards the end that potentially could decrease uh, uh, entropy. But, these all remain incredibly speculative. Um, the best person on, on that last one is actually is Thomas Nail, who writes a bit on that, and, and Ravelli as well. Um, but for the most part, the, most people still think that it's the most, uh, the most certain of, of, uh, of situations. Okay, so um, it's worth uh, very quickly before I move on, actually, uh, to say, to talk about these two, the two laws right now. This is kind of a summary. Um, so Clausius, Rudolf Clausius, another one of the major figures, uh, lots of people I've been speaking about, but um, in classical thermodynamics, it's kind of uh, Thomson, uh, Clausius, uh, the, the two big ones, um, Rankin as well, but anyway, but the, at the end of in 1965, um, Clausius gives these two laws, right? and these two laws uh, are what are you know, still hold to a certain extent, and these are laws from which everything else is deduced. So, um, one, the energy of the universe is constant, and then two, the entropy of the universe tends to a, a maximum. Right? Um, there are there are two other laws, but we won't really uh, talk about them uh, so much. Um, there is a zeroth law and a third law, but uh, oh, yeah, I might pick, pick up on those at some other point, but they're not so important um, at the moment. Um, what's interesting here is that is that the notion of entropy, which is the, probably the you know energy and entropy. Now, this is now thermodynamics now becomes a science of energy and entropy. Right, it's now in 19, it's 1865. Uh, energy as a term is gradually being uh, folded into the history um, and now by, by 65 becomes the main way of talking about this relationship between transformations, um, uh, the relationship between potential and kinetic, for example, uh, mechanical and the, the, all different types of energy at this point kind of come, <laughs> kind of go, you know, a huge list of different types of energies. But um, entropy this is the first time that this, that this kind of like uh, pops up. And this is to name precisely this notion of dissipation. Um, it names also, what's interesting here is that Clausius says that he wants it to be almost identical, or not identical, as he says something like it's, these words are so nearly aligned in their physical meaning to energy, but that's why he chose it, right? He purposely chose something that was uh, similar to, to, to energy. Um, one might think that's kind of strange, you know, that you choose something that seems to be its negation as something so close. Um, but but uh, I'll talk a little bit about that at another point. And I think that trying to hold on to uh, the notion that what entropy really describes is just a different well, in classical mechanics is the way that motive power is derived through differences um, is one way of trying to trying to remove the dread out of what entropy is right um, if Carnot's principle is uh, essentially just saying that you know motive power is derived through a difference of temperatures and that's what dissipation is and that's what entropy is and if entropy then in that sense is that difference or the, the working of that difference? Entropy is the is the motive force. Actually, entropy starts everything. Without entropy, nothing moves. In that sense, it's a very positive thing. You know, it's that which uh, we uh, which we have to have. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, nothing moves. Um, uh, I certainly think it's one way of, of trying to remove uh, uh, it's the value in it. You know, the dreadful nature of it. Is a uh, before we before I move uh, very quickly very we're moving for last stuff now but 
you can see also here, I mean, I won't, I'll try not to do as much as mathematics as possible, but we can see here how also how energy and entropy. This is the first one on the left is the uh, is the equation for the perfect uh, efficiency from from Kano. The middle is is what's called exergy or available energy. Uh, it's the energy available to do motive power. Um, and the last is the integral oh no, it's, yeah, of um, it's actually not written as an integral there, but it's 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 entropy, right? And so. What must be seen through all of them is they're all a re relationship between the transfer of heat and the temperature uh, which results from that transfer of heat. That's what they all have to do with. Right? Um, entropy is basically saying that it's how much has the difference between temperatures uh, been used in a way. Right? How much is there left of that difference of temperatures that can be then used for motive power? Um, very, very similar to uh, um, uh, exergy, which is the middle one, which is the available energy. Um, the, the opposite, and that, so there's lots and lots of terms that are kind of bound around. Um, energy, exergy, entropy, energy, there's loads, right? So uh, when I talk about exergy, um, it's my terminology for, it's actually not mine, it was Rant that invented it. It's talking about what energy is available still in order to pr produce motive power, right? And energy, which is the opposite of exergy, is another term for entropy, which basically means what is no longer left, uh, uh, that which has been used to produce motive power. Um, so there's kind of some terminology, and, I, and, I, and I'll use those uh, throughout. Um, yeah. I, I actually personally think that that, that energy uh, is probably maybe as just as, as confusing as entropy, um, because in a way the the original uh, uh, mathematics behind energy is essentially the same as vis viva. It's the same as movement, as kinetic energy. Um, there's also thousands of types of energy, um, and we call it identity. Anyway, but now I would, we'll go into that a, a, a little bit later. But uh, um, let's move very, very quickly to back to to Nietzsche. Okay. So um, the, the first person, so now I've kind of gone through the history very briefly. Um, hopefully some of the problems kind of uh, have, have arisen um, uh, through that discussion. So this was about the early reception. Um, and I've already tried to weave in some of the figures that I wanted us to look at. Um, and I'll kind of conclude by, by looking at this. Um, so the arguably the person, the earliest person to within kind of to, to write within philosophy, to write on uh, write on thermodynamics, uh, is Friedrich Lang. It's kind of middle one. Um, Friedrich Lang's famous book called History of Materialism was published in in eighteen sixty six, um, and then became very 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 popular. Was was continually published in the the eighteen seventies. Probably one of the most influential books for for Nietzsche. Um, Lots and lots of notes of Nietzsche taking uh, taking notes from from Lang. Uh, lots of ideas come from Lang that you can see in Nietzsche, um, and uh, if Nietzsche is kind of quoting uh, stuff to do with thermodynamics, it's it's I, the, I've kind of looked at the citations, and they're pretty much most likely just coming straight from Lang, apart from some of the slightly later stuff, which is by someone called Otto Kasperi. Otto Kasperi probably the, the, the next person to write uh, something on, on thermodynamics. Um, uh, in, uh, in 1875. Um, and they're all, all of these can be seen to, to kind of follow on from Helmholtz lecture that I gave you, that I gave to set. So that lecture, this public lecture is the one which Lang quotes the most. It's the one that Kasperi quotes. It's the one that Nietzsche quotes. It's a very, very, very important lecture for, for this early reception. Um, the first thing that actually Nietzsche uh, uh, writes on thermodynamics, um, this is important to, to, to kind of, I, I gave a bit earlier, but the first thing he writes is in the 18, really right in the 1870s. 
these aren't published as such. These are the lectures that, that Nietzsche gives um, on the pre, he calls them the pre-Platonics. So if I'm using that term, uh, it's because he uses it. Um, and in particular in his, in his uh, lesson on, on Heraclitus. These are also important because they're at the same time that, that uh, Nietzsche is also writing um, on truth and lying in a non-moral sense and on the pathos of truth, uh, these texts are used by uh, by, by uh, Ray Bressier in his uh, his last chapter on on extinction. So when Bressier is talking about uh, extinction, when he's talking about Nietzsche, this is the period, right? This is the the kind of early uh, 70, uh, 1870s. Um, there are what I first spoke about when in the is the eighties. It's 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 really to do with the eternal return. The idea is kind of here uh, in Nietzsche in the 1870s, but it doesn't really become uh, theorized properly until 1881 um, to 1884. I always forget which date it is, the Sils Maria years. But anyway, the um, so so this is the very good, important context for understanding also um, uh, what Bressier is talking about. And here, what's really, really interesting is um, he's talking about the death of the sun. So, and here he's taking this directly from, from Helmholtz. Um, and uh, what's also at stake still here in the 18, well, early here in the 1870s is the problem of transformation. And in particular, as he takes this out of, out of Heraclitus, um, I will read these, uh, read these two as well, so we can see them. So here he's talking about Heraclitus, right? He's talking about the philosophy of Heraclitus. This is the lesson that he says to his uh, to his students. So these are his lecture notes. Um, apparently, there's also uh, writings to say that he got very, very animated when he was talking, uh, in particularly this lesson. So uh, it's uh, I won't pretend to be Nietzsche, but apparently, you know, he was sat down with this one. He stood up and, and, and gave it. So. Um, at the greatest level, uh, nothing absolutely unalterable exists. Our earthly world must eventually perish for inexorable uh, reasons. The heat of the sun cannot last eternally. It is inconceivable that this warmth uh, produce motion without other forces being consumed. We may pose every hypothesis concerning the heat of the sun. It comes to this, that its source of heat is finite. In the course of tremendous time spans, the duration of sunlight and heat, so interminable to us, must completely vanish. Physiologist and physicist Hermann Ludwig von Helmholtz, just writes Helmholtz, uh, says, says in his essay on the interaction of natural forces, that's the essay that was set, it's the one that Lang quotes, we come thereby to the unavoidable conclusion that every tide, although with infinite slowness, still with certainty diminishes the stores of mechanical force of the system. And as a consequence of this, the rotation of the planets in question around their axis must become more slow. They must, trust, they must draw nearer to the sun or its satellites. Thus, we must not speak of our astronomical time and scale in an absolute sense. Well, this is the intuitive perception of Heraclitus there is no thing of which we may say it is. He rejects being. He knows only becoming the flowing. He considers belief in something persistent as error and foolishness. To this, he adds this thought. That which becomes is one thing in eternal transformation. And the law of this eternal transformation, this the logos in all things is precisely this one, fire. So what is... Uh, what is interesting here is, in comparison to the later work here, is um, of course this is an essay on on uh, on Heraclitus. Um, what Nietzsche seems to be deducing or taking out uh, from this is is quite is a bit confused. So it's in relation to um, he tries to deduce a notion of eternal transformation, or eternal transformation, uh, precisely. Uh, the very thing that he was critiquing at the end on the notion of infinite transformation, he talks about infinite novelty from Helmholtz, right? And tries to then say that this is the thought of, of Heraclitus. Um, it's interesting that he would use, so he tries to say that, you know, everything perishes, everything changes. That's what he's saying, yeah? everything perishes. 
everything changes. The sun will die, etc. What is interesting here, though, is that the Helmholtz on the interaction of forces, although it certainly does talk about you know, perishing, uh, it certainly doesn't talk about eternal transformation. Precisely, obviously, it talks about finite transformation. It's very difficult, very strange that nature would nature would use a text that talks about finite transformation, even if that finite transformation is talking about perishing and dying and change, to then try to align that to Heraclitus and eternal transformation. No, it's a, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a, the best, best there. There's something that he's doing that is, you know, is interesting. What's also very interesting is that, that, um, that Lang precisely uh, in his work is talking about the way that, uh, you know, he certainly isn't someone that he's, he's a Kantian in the Kantian, right? He quotes at the end of almost every chapter, well, not at the end of captures, captures, we can only speak about that of which we know, right? Uh, it's very strange that he would, that, that Lang would somehow talk about some form of internal transformation and that he would take that from Lang and that Lang would take that from Helmholtz. Actually, Lang doesn't say that at all either. Lang criticizes the use of eternity um, by people. He says it's too easy to talk about eternity. Um, so again, it's very strange that, uh, that Nietzsche is almost inverted uh, what uh, he takes from Lang and what Lang takes from Helmholtz. Um, it's also very <laughs> kind of strange as well that there's this not sort of reception uh, around the eternal return and around Nietzsche and Lang that um, people think that, that Lang came up or that Nietzsche reading Lang came up with this idea of the eternal return. Uh, Lang quotes Blanqui um, as having said this idea, um, but uh, he's certainly in the cosmogony uh, uh, you know, uh, is quoting the relationship, quoting uh, thermodynamics and certainly not trying to argue for the eternal return. Okay. Um, the last, uh, last couple of minutes. Um, so, these are these are not these aren't the the bit that you know Brassier doesn't pick up on this. Um, uh, these are the last notes, and I quoted one very bit at the very beginning, you know, of the will to power. Um, these are the notes that the are uh, uh, where Nietzsche is precisely trying to uh, thermodynamically uh, prove the eternal return. So, very very quickly, the eternal return. I've not got very much time, but the eternal return for for Nietzsche. He says that it is um, it is predicated. Right? The eternal return is an inevitable consequence of the principle of conservation of energy. He says right? the first law. Right? Um, he then tries to say that uh, uh, I'm trying to get this. To, don't want to don't want to go too quickly. Um, he he also tries to say that the eternal return um, refutes. Um, heat death. The way that he says that he does that it does this is by he says feeding on itself. Right? He says something like it's like a snake feeding its own tail. Right? The eternal return. Um, let me try and find this because I think it's important to just say, even though we haven't got much time. Uh, oh, did I write it down? I hope I did. Uh, All right. Let's just. Uh, I will finish this with this last this last quote, where it's very similar. I think might might have uh, missed it, but he talks about it refuting it. He talks about the eternal return as being fed on its own circle, and in this sense, the eternal return functions very much like a uh, uh, perpetual motion machine. Right? It can feed itself from itself. Um, okay. And so this is the world that Nietzsche kind of uh, gives us. So this is the universe, the cosmology of the eternal return. I'll finish on this. Right? And do you know what I take the world to be? Shall I hold my mirror up to it? This world is a monster of energy without beginning or end, a fixed and invariable magnitude of energy. Uh, oh, we still have 30 minutes, someone says. Oh, that's okay. Okay, well, um, uh, that's, that's good. Okay, so I won't have to rush. I thought that we only had, uh, that's good. Okay. Um, that's good actually, because we can open up for discussions after I've said this. So um, I'll start from the beginning. Again. And do you know what I take the world to be? Shall I hold my mirror up to it? This world is a monster of energy without beginning or end, a fixed and invariable magnitude of energy, no more, no less, which is never expended, merely transformed 
of an alterable, an alterable size as a whole, whose budget is, is without either expenses or losses, but likewise without gains or earnings, surrounded and bounded by nothingness. Tis nothing indefinite or dispersed, nothing infinitely extended, but rather a determinate amount of energy set in a determinate space, and not a space which would be empty anywhere, but on the contrary, a space everywhere filled with energy, a play of energy and waves of energy, simultaneously the one and the many, waxing here and waning there, an ocean of temptuous and torrential energies, forever changing, forever rolling back with enormous periods of recurrence, with an ebb and flow of its conf configurations, bringing forth the most complicated from the simplest, the most fiery, fierce and self-contradictory from the most still, rigid and cold, and then from this profusion returning again to simplicity, from this play of contradictions, back to the joy of concord, still affirming itself in the identity of its courses and ages, forever blessing itself as that which eternally recurs, a becoming which knows no satiety, disgust or weariness. Right, so it's good actually that we have some time, I think, now to, to, to maybe open up or some, ask some questions and... Um, so that's uh, that's how that's how the will to power ends. That's the last thing that, that is in that book. Uh, um, absolutely amazing uh, pieces of writing. It's uh, there's no one better than, than Nietzsche as a stylist. Uh, but yeah, I suppose the questions would ask. You know, we need to ask ourselves: Is is um, how does something like heat death complicate? How does entropy complicate what Nietzsche is trying to say? Um, you know, is the eternal return still a possibility? Um, uh, is it not? Can we maintain the eternal return as something that is important, regardless of the fact that cosmologically it cannot be uh, sustained? These are all, uh, I think, very important questions that, that, that we need to ask. And that, that continue throughout the, let me just, uh, just bring this, uh, well, maybe I haven't got it here. Uh, by the beginning, quickly here, yeah. So this last um, uh, set of, uh, we can see here before I stop. These, this is kind of some of the reception of, of, of this this idea, Nietzsche's idea, right? Um, so, very very importantly, actually, Borges is uh, writing on the the doctrine of cycles in 1934. It's probably the most interesting refutation. There's also Abel Ray as well in the 1920s, and the very early one is is Fourier in 1909. Um, for those who are interested in, and then we'll, I'll open it up. For those who are interested in in probably the best pieces of writing from a historical position or interpretive position uh, on Nietzsche's eternal return and its relationship with thermodynamics. Uh, Paolo Diori is probably the best. Um, he's a French-Italian uh, scholar who is the person also that has done, set up the, the uh, get out, uh, the, the collected works online, the digital version of the collected works, um, and his work on on this kind of early reception of, of, of thermodynamics is is is, is amazing, and and um, you know kind of very indebted to to lots of, to lots of his work for trying to figure some of this stuff stuff out. Okay, so I think that um, although I might have rushed some bits, I think it's good to open it up now to to questions. Um, if not. Um, I'll carry on speaking, but there you go. Oh, stop sharing. Is there anything that, um, that you know within the science maybe that that is uh, that needs clarifying. Hey, um, yeah, I have a question. Yep. Uh, going a bit back to maybe the first third or first half. I think it's two two things which yeah may be a bit basic but um I am not so fluent in, in natural sciences and what I found interesting um you mentioned at some point um 
classic classical mechanics, heat, thermodynamics as sciences. And that kind of struck me in a way because I felt, oh, when I started to read for the seminar, I was just thinking of all of it as physics. Mm. And and so my question was sort of, okay, so those were kind of their own, like those were domains of experimentation, of thought. And then later they kind of became subsumed under, under a broader field that, that called itself physics. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's a question I had. And in a way, as you said, also like thermodynamics got coined retroactively like so many other things too and so for me it sounded almost like these different sciences that then later get, became integrated might still form something that is like that we call physics but that still is something internally conflictual like for instance the 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 i don't know the contradiction between uh, theory of relativity and quantum dynamics, uh, quantum mechanics. I think that that was one question I had. And um, the other one was um, something related to the Helmholtz text, which um, I tried to keep it short, but it's on page 12 at the bottom and then 13 top, where he talks about um, heat and other forces mm. and um, and he's saying so the sentence goes according to this we can divide the total force store of the universe into two parts mm -hmm. one of which is heat uh, and must continue to be such the other and then he names a few like chemical mechanical electrical magnetical forces uh, is capable of the most varied changes of form. And I was curious what, like, uh, when I was reading that, and as I said, like, I'm not so so fluent in natural sciences, and, um, but was Helmholtz setting up some kind of primacy for, like, heat and then other natural forces? Or how can we, how can we understand this relation between because it seems like heat is very primal or kind of like has some, I don't know, like almost in, like it's, it's not like one among many. It seems like there's, there's some, something, yeah, I don't know, um, where heat is maybe a condition of possibility for other, or at least for the, for the motive um, forces also. Yeah. I might be get, getting a bit confused, but that that was another question I had. Mm -hmm. No, these are both very good questions because I think that the 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 complication is precisely the problem of 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 the the retroactive historicizing of science. Like as you're saying, I mean, this, the the problem is that firstly with the the first, you know, we, I was probably just calling them sciences, you know, because that's what they mean now. They are now. Um, but I mean, I don't know if you noticed that, but you know, the the, the question of natural philosophy as well. Thought that's what I thought that's what your question was going to be about but you know the these people called themselves natural philosophers you know um uh i think that it's it's uh um what's his name it, thompson for example is the professor of natural philosophy at glasgow um he's the one that sets up the kind of the, the laboratory in glasgow you know, hamart's called him a natural himself a natural philosopher um and the, the question of whether they can be understood as 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 sciences, yeah, I mean, that's, it's to do with the the, form, the formation of disciplines and their reduction to to physics, for example. Now, you know, and even the question of where would you where do you do thermodynamics now, right, is an interesting question because thermodynamics is is particularly this kind of classical thermodynamics is is taught mostly or predominantly within mechanical engineering classes. So that's, that's how I learned it. I did a mechanical engineering course uh, online, you know. Um, but it's also a physics. It's, it's it, and this question of 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 the the reduction or the relationship between domains is something that we'll pick up actually in the third. It's a very very important question for the philosophy of science. Is is how do these things interact with each other? Do they actually well, again as you're saying? Do they have uh, 
internal sets of uh, logic or logical in, uh, internal logic, which cannot be then uh, applied external, externally to it. So does does energy, what energy means, for what energy means uh, for, uh, say, for Young, the first person that ever uses it, right, in, in 1807, which he just uses it for a synonym for Leibniz's vis, vis viva, does what he say there, energy, is that the same thing as when we say energy and quantum mechanics? You know, they're the same word and they're trying to deal with similar things, but uh, these are all very, very good questions. I don't know if I'm really answering you, but it's uh, it's it's certainly like, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, again, if you look at, look at someone like Sadiq Arnaud, the founding person who founds thermodynamics, right? He was, he was in a polytechnic in a military school uh, in France. He's theorizing these things from within a context of, of uh, as a as a soldier, right? He's, so very, and they were they had to do uh, mechanics at, at, at university, but like so, it's it's very interesting where you would where these are placed within domains. Um, the 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 newest, I suppose we could say, just to kind of talk about domains for a second. The newest is quantum thermodynamics. Uh, quantum thermodynamics. Um, that's the kind of most up to date, I suppose you could call, uh, and that takes place in physics departments, um, um, and that's. Fundamentally, a, a continuation of the of, of the attempt to try and relate information to to energy and entropy, uh, things like entanglement. But I won't go, won't really go into that. But yeah, it's it's a very very interesting question because the the division or the domains uh, are, are being formed actually at this time. So this is so you have this nineteenth century is the period of the, of the splitting of domains in, in a certain sense, the end of natural philosophy of whatever we mean by that, the rise of science. Uh, the rise of what we call physics and 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 yeah, so it's a very good question. The second the second one is um, um, is also really interesting, and uh, the um, the relationship between force and energy. I think you'll notice that uh, I don't think he uses it unless it's been translated badly. Helmholtz probably won't use energy. Um, Helmholtz will use force. Um, the the reason why Helmholtz does this is because, again, it's what's very, very interesting from a kind of historical position, from a, from a kind of critical epistemological, epistemological position, is that is that the, the the foundations or the founding of this paradigm takes place across different countries, and those different countries have different uh, agendas, uh, political, uh, uh, industrial agendas, um, and theological, uh, religious agendas. Um, Interesting enough, uh, Helmholtz, um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a German and someone that in 1947 uh, wrote this on the, on the conservation of force, um, in particular was trying to continue to use the notion of force because he's the one that came up with the law of the conservation of force or the conservation of energy. So he's, he's, you can read the letters, they're very, very interesting about the kind of backwards and forwards and, and the Germans, not all of them like the English. Uh, and the, the, the two, the, the ones that people always really hate is Mayer. Mayer is this kind of like, bit of a kind of, uh, he's this experimentalist and, and uh, didn't really know how to do his maths. And the English really, you know, grabbed onto that and said, well, you know, you've got, you, you've got this person that supposedly came up with the idea of the conservation of energy, but you know, you can't even do his maths right. Um, so what I'm trying to say is that it's uh, that it's it's very interesting about this kind of war of uh, of concepts that's going on at this point. Um, energy uh, is uh, is the the, the um, becomes uh, I would say uh, the the arrival of energy as a as a concept that crosses, if you will, the boundary. It's the it's out of all of the, the thermodynamic concepts, it's the one that has crossed the boundary into general. Uh, the people know what energy is to a certain extent when you say, you know, if you're, if you're on the side of a serial packet, it'll have energy, right? It won't have entropy, right? So it's something that people kind of understand. Um, it was in a text in 1860, 1966 by Tate and Thompson that wrote an, an article called Energy, just called Energy in this, this uh, very, very popular magazine called Good Words that had a readership of about, I don't know how many, it's something about 70,000, I think. And so their attempt to try and write, <laughs> to make energy the, the term uh, was something that was, you know, uh, the use of propaganda in a sense, you know. Um, I don't know whether that, that answers your question, but um, certainly uh, now, if we think about uh, energy, you know, that we still have now fundamental, what we call fundamental forces, 
which are distinct from energy to a certain extent. Um, within this within this context, energy is, is seen as a kind of condition of force. But um, yeah, I don't know what that answers. There you go. <laughs> some 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 ways. I don't know who, I can see some people raised their hand, but I don't know who else I don't know came first, but Paula, do you have a question? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Um, I have three questions, but the first one is quite an administrative one, which sure, is yeah, yeah. Um, how the presentations are going to take place. Like, are we going to send videos or are we going to do it um, on a stream or... Mm -hmm. or that um, and the second one is related to how um this this thermodynamics theory um relates to biological forms because precisely in 19th century is when um the organisms are considered as a unities of sense which are autonomous and they are like the cause of its own ex existence so even if I understand that um, in, in entropy can be considered as uh, the tendency to die of the organisms, I don't know how um, the the autonomous part of the organisms as a kind of uh, preservation of the self uh, works in relation to the heat transference. Mm -hmm. uh, so how uh, more or less I don't know what the science says about that, but how relates the heat with the biological um, organisms function? And the third one is more like a historical one, which is like how mm, how comes to be the scientific uh, gesture to transfer this uh, structure of the energy and the heat um, in the in the genes. Uh, and in machines to the universe because nowadays you if you search for um, thermodynamics theory in i don't know wikipedia you are going to find that they talk about the movement of the heat uh, in portions of the of uh, in portions uh, stable portions of the universe and how the energy uh, tends to uh, dissipate uh, so that's how they talk about the entropy so i don't know how it happens to be that from the machines uh, and the yes mechanical uh, realms it becomes to a universal theory which is when laws have sense when you have to uh, talk about laws the, th the three laws of um, thermodynamics it's because it becomes it becomes like absolute and pure and because of that, it's applicable to universe. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm being clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. They're, they're all very good questions. Very, very. Good. I mean, the, the first one, just to talk about the administ administrative stuff. Um, I was talking a bit earlier about that, and I think that um, because the, as you can see, I, I didn't get, I didn't uh, talk about the the Marxist ecology stuff, and it would be great if someone. Um, or some people who wanted to give presentations would give those live maybe next week and that would potentially be the only one that is live because I think it would be good because there's just so much stuff I knew that I wasn't going to get around to it today and um, so I would what I would hope is would be maybe some people would like to give a presentation next week on that stuff which is still this early reception because it's still kind of around the end of the 19th century um, and might be slightly fairly you know more maybe slightly more accessible now that we've we've gone through uh this today but then the rest i would think maybe to be sent through um i would i would think unless people have kind of absolute uh really want to present things but that will be organized also by uh Pradeep, no? Pradeep? So, i think to, to organize um, um yes i'll be sending out a mail but i think if uh, we can then sort of uh volunteer for the presentation that you're talking about um as soon as possible even right now if somebody is yeah. just interested um that'll be great i mean that'll just be fixed as of now yeah so yeah i don't know if anyone that's a good, what we'll do is maybe we can think about that now um 
We've got 10 minutes still, and I'll answer some of these other questions. And then who maybe someone who would like to give a presentation or, or a group of prep people who would like to give a presentation next week on that Marxist ecology stuff set, uh, kind of think about it and maybe put their hand, put themselves forward by the end. Um, if not, respond and send an email through. Uh, yeah. So the, the 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 question about biology and then the extension of the the question of mechanics to the uh, to the co to the cosmology or to the universe. So the the biology we will look at this very, very in, in lots of detail next week because the the Bergson text is about this. It's about evolution. Um, it's about the relationship that organisms have to energy um, and the question of death and life. Um, the uh, and as you said, as you kind of kind of picked up the, the question of the problem of, well, life seems to be something slightly different from, uh, from an engine. It seems to, to maintain its organization. Um, it's even in the Helmholtz text, he says, well, it, it seemed life seemed to look like some form of perpetual motion machine. Um, and uh, those, those are certainly very important uh, uh, for, you know, I mean, lots of the 19th century is, is kind of really talking about uh, lots of the continuation of thermodynamics, continu continuation of its relationship to the problems of life. Um, the, you know, one of the kind of the the ways that uh, there's many responses to this actually um, is to try to conceptually distinguish between complexity, order, disorganization, um, and disorder on one side. What does that mean at a different at a particular level? Um, from notions of dissipation, so through co the consumption, for example, of, of food, of nutrients, um, is the breaking down of, of particular chemical differences that then allows that to be converted into ATP in the cells by, by in mitochondria that allows for the continuation of the organism to, to, to live. Homeostasis this is the problem that, uh, that cybernetics uh, you know, uh, picked up on, uh, the question of, of the maintenance of a particular system away from uh, 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 away from uh, entropy. So how does a, a particular organism or a particular system avoid just collapsing straight away to, to entropy? Um, the other side of it is um, the one which is popularized by uh, people like uh, Dorian Sagan and Schneider, Schneider and Sagan, their book, Into the Cool. We talk about how life actually is a is a is not only a kind of um, a condition of a dissipation or the increase of entropy, but, but participates in it, that the universe is more entropic because of life. Um, what that life tends to, what they call gradients, tends to break down gradients, breaks down differences to perpetuate itself. Um, so these are the kind of different ways that people have looked at it. I mean, even, even to the point whereby uh, Boltzmann um, relating uh, entropy uh, and thermodynamics to Darwinian uh, evolution spoke about uh, the evolution of, of, of life uh, of life as the struggle for entropy. This is what he writes in the, the end of the 19th century. And insofar as what species do is they struggle for, they, they compete for a limited amount or, of, new, or, or of resources of which those resources are the differences inherent to the world, which can then be broken down to perpetuate the species. So what Boltzmann meant when he said something like, it's the struggle for entropy, it's the struggle for breaking down precisely those differences. Um, this then becomes actually a principle in, in, in biology called the maximum entropy principle and, and lots of other things. But um, uh, so that's the kind of answering to that. The, 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 the movement into the cosmos comes via, uh, uh, from machines to, these kind of via machines actually to life and then to life to the sun and then the sun to the universe. So. Thompson in The Age of the Sun, uh, he tries to calculate uh, the age of the sun and recognizes precisely this movement. Well, okay, well, life seems to function similarly to engines. It requires fuel to a certain extent, it requires food. Where does that food come from? Well, it eats, uh, well, uh, it eats either uh, animals or it eats, uh, it eats uh, uh, biomass that comes from vegetation, comes from plants. Where do plants derive their, their food from? Plants derive their food from the sun. Um, and so the sun then is theorized by Thompson as this great dissipative force. That the sun um, has this huge amount of energy that it gives out. Um, Bataille will pick up on this. Um, lots of people will pick up, Nietzsche picks up on this as we saw. Um, so that, that's the move actually to the cosmos. 
oh, well, then it seems as though the stars are, if the stars are partaking of this general movement of heat outwards, and that heat goes out to the earth, then the suns must die. And if the suns must die, then there's this kind of cosmological uh, uh, relation to, to, to this. Um, of course, the, in a kind of in a relation to falsifiability, um, uh, you know, you, you'd, once that law is then stated with, uh, within a theory, within the theory, you then have to try and falsify it to try and prove it wrong, right? And so far, that's not happened. Right? There's been no evidence whatsoever or observation of uh, of that tendency being otherwise, if it's not also uh, reciprocally uh, uh, dissipating somewhere else. So you can have a refrigerator, for example. A refrigerator is the inverse of uh, a heat machine, right? It makes things colder. The only way that it makes things colder is by dissipating energy somewhere else, usually in a, in a coal, coal plant or a nuclear power plant. Um, so that's the kind of, that's the, and that, I, I call that uh, entropic displacement, that movement of, of uh, you gra gradually trying to find what the source is, right? And the source is always entropy at some, at some level. Okay, uh, last question maybe, but... Uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. me. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I, I, this is just like clarification question. That might just have been the whole point of the last half of the presentation. But like, I, like, I don't think it was like, I, the, I think the connection between like entropy and then the eternal return was not, was like not, um, or like, I'm still not sure what that connection is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Basically, yeah. Okay. Just... So, sure, sure. So, um, the the connection to it is um well actually it's what one could say that it's the it, it asked ask nietzsche to what extent does entropy play a role in the eternal return so does it complicate the eternal return is the eternal return a something that as nietzsche says is predicated only on the first law so this conservation of energy is equal transformations of energy so it's it kind of doesn't partake of Nietzsche's thought insofar as he kind of doesn't let it, because if he did let it, um, it might destroy the, the thought of the eternal return, um, because you can't have an eternal return of the same. Um, if, if the energy source that drives that return is dissipated. So that's the, the way that it kind of uh, is connected. Uh, insofar as this is my particular interpretation is that, um, is that, Nietzsche came across these at a particular time where, um, you know, the, the heat death of the universe um, and entropy to a certain extent was still being discussed. And as I said, it still is. It still was still being refuted by people. Um, and I think basically Nietzsche, if he had to try and include entropy properly into his thoughts, then the eternal return wouldn't be able to function uh, uh, as he wanted it to. Um, particularly when he describes it as this, this notion of feeding on itself, right? Um, somehow the eternal return would have to function like a perpetual motion machine. So that's the, that's the way that it kind of uh, figures is that, um, uh, yeah, or you'd have to think of a cosmology where, okay, maybe entropy does happen, but then it comes back on itself. So a big crunch kind of um, idea um, where, where where you kind of get to the very end and then it restarts itself all, all over again. Um, but that has also now kind of been been uh, debunked. Um, my personal thought is is that, that Nietzsche kind of partakes of this. What would you do, for example, this is the way I think about it. If, you know, you'd been, you'd been, this thought comes to you where you think it's going to be the absolutely revolutionary thought, the, the most, the weightiest thoughts of all thoughts, right? Um, the one that will be kind of like your crowning, the crowning glory of your of your of your project, that which you think will undo metaphysics, and it, then you come to kind of like uh, the, 80, the the eighteen eighties, and you recognise that actually mechanically there's another theory that's actually disproving what you want. I personally feel that there's a kind of pushback from Nietzsche, um, uh, so and so that's what I think that that he that, that kind of happens. He kind of pushes back against uh, something that would complicate his own project. Okay. Thank you. That's interesting. Thanks. The 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 person just uh, maybe just to finish here as well actually because it's 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 five thirty now that it finishes I think um, this is I, the 
what uh, Nicholas or Nicola is uh, pointing out here is that you know that it's a, that it's that second law is merely an empirical law. I think is very very important. It's certainly the the way that I try to look at these things um, is well, slightly differently because I think that there are that from a Kantian position there is this kind of backwards and forwards. But it's absolutely true that that uh, that uh, there's something like heat death cannot be confirmed. Right. Um, it can't be confirmed precisely because it kind of it, 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 uh, it stops or blocks its own capacity to be to be uh, experienced, right? Can't partake of, of any kind of empirical uh, affirmation, and I think that that's uh, it's kind of kind of interesting for me is to think that, and this is what uh, this is kind of what I've been trying to, to think about it is that this goes back onto the last the last question here is that. If then heat death and the, the, the eternal return function as ideas, so in Kant, ideas are these things which are, you know, they can't be experienced, but they, they nonetheless somehow guide the way that we act or the way that we experience things in the, in the present. Um, how do they function differently? So if one talks about this kind of absolute end whereby there is a kind of an infinity or, or that continues or one kind of cyclically returns, if they both act as differing competing ideas, um, what then, does, how then does that structure uh, the way that we experience the world or act in the world? That's the question that I, that I kind of, the way that I try to think about it, um, which is also very different from the way that say, uh, Bressier does as well in the, uh, um, in Nihil Unbound. But um, we'll leave that then maybe for, for, uh, for the last session. Okay, I think uh, that's it. Um, did anyone want to, uh, Put their hand up for a presentation for the Marxist ecology stuff next week. Okay, cool. Okay, great. So that's uh, Diego. Um, okay, so if if anyone else would like to do it with Diego, if it's just Diego, um, uh, please email Pradeep and myself, and um, I will we will talk about that. That's that's great. Okay. I think that's uh, one more thing. Also, uh, anyone else wants to sign up for the presentation? Uh, I've shared the spreadsheet with all of you on the mail. Uh, if you are still on the find it, you can send me uh, email anyways. Um, I'll be sending an email attaching the link so that will be helpful as well. So, uh, sorry, but please register yourself for the presentation. Yes. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll also be sharing these presentations in the group folders as well, the, the, the PowerPoint, so you can go back over them um, later. Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for for, uh, for sticking with it and going through, and hopefully we will pick up on, on stuff on Bergson and Simondon next week as well. So maybe some more, so, uh, a little bit, maybe less history of the science and some more kind of textual analysis. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. See you next week. Bye-bye.